Hey, welcome back to another episode of the Ruby Rogues podcast. This week on our panel, we have Valentino Stoll. Hey, now. Dave Kimura. Hey, everyone. I'm Charles Maxwood from Top End Devs. This week, we have a special guest, and that's Andrew Atkinson. So, Hi, Andrew, do you. you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'd love to. Thank you. Uh, my name is Andrew, and uh, I'm a software engineer. And uh, the last few years, um, I've been really focusing on uh, how to best use Postgres as a database with Ruby on Rails web applications. And I've most of my career has been doing that for different companies. And uh, I'm uh, excited to be here today to talk about a book I've been working on. Yeah. Do you want to tell us, I mean, what, what prompted the book? Yeah, I think um, the probably the main thing was just a desire to kind of, you know, help more people. And I mean, you know, to help my own career, you know, help grow my career through impact and that kind of thing. And I felt like a book would be something uh, that could help me do that. It, you know, it, it's, it's a work in, in progress, so we'll see. But I think um, I, I felt like from working at a bunch of companies and on a bunch of different teams, and even from my own experience with my own career earlier in my career, I felt like I always lacked kind of like, you know, I could always have benefited from more knowledge of SQL indexes, uh, database administration, data types, like all, all sorts of topics. And, um, you know, I, I guess I had the opportunity to um, focus on that more at a couple jobs as a full-time employee. And um, I just kept finding that it was more and more interesting as I kind of peeled back layers and was really enthusiastic to learn more and then kind of fit my natural style of wanting to share and teach. And um, I can tell you more about this, but I was approached after presenting at a conference to uh, whether or not I had an interest in writing a book on Postgres. And that's kind of how the whole thing started. <clears throat> so I want to get one thing, you know, out in the open right off the bat, because I think it's important to talk about. But, you know, please tell me if like, hey, just go buy the book, you know, if needed. So most of the time, as we as developers create web applications and stuff, it's not the language or framework that's slow. It's not even the database that's that is slow. It is us as developers that are creating slow queries, slow interactions and calculations. So what is your opinion on optimizing at the database level or the server side of things versus just writing better code? Yeah, well, um, I think, you know, since I'm most experienced as a developer, I can speak more to that side. As I've tried to build out my own <clears throat> Postgres specialization, I've tried to pick up kind of maybe what would have been more DBA skills in the past. So I do have some familiarity with tuning parameters and things like that. But yeah, I agree. I mean, generally, you know, we as developers, you know, we mostly take them for granted. We just expect that they work because that's their job is to durably store our data and to make it fast for lots of, you know, lots of people accessing the data. And, <clears throat> um, you know, I, it, it actually continues to be super fascinating to me how over decades um, there's this, there are these two really different paradigms, which are, you know, relational databases and object-oriented programming. Object-oriented programming is not the only programming paradigm, of course, but like with Ruby on Rails, uh, you know, Ruby, language and other languages, it's a, you know, maybe the most popular paradigm. So we've got these, we got these like object layers and hierarchies that developers are thinking about. And then we have this kind of general purpose database. And for a lot of operations and a lot of scale, it's actually fine. You can just kind of use it without really knowing how it works. But what I found uh, regularly at like, mostly at VC backed startup companies I've worked for um, I've tended to join them kind of at like at a series series A sort of stage where they're in a scaling mode. You know, they might have a product market fit with their product. And what happens is kind of like, you know, queries that were fine on smaller sized tables with less rows or at smaller levels of concurrency, um, they start to become problematic. You know, the they they start to slow down and it affects user experience. And then and then that's where um, that's where there's a need to then go a little bit more deeper with your relational database. Like 
how does this work? What is actually happening when I run this? What are the queries that are be gen being generated, right? And then what's actually happening within Postgres to fetch the data that my queries need? So <clears throat> I think um, my general or kind of generic advice is for most people getting started, I don't think there's, you know, I think I'd love for everyone, every Rails developer to buy the book uh, and even other web app developers. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't think that, you know, if they're just getting started, it's going to be, you know, there, there's definitely value in there for things like constraints and things that aren't really related to high volume access patterns. But the book is really targeted when you're kind of like scaling up and you need to know how things work a bit more. You need to know about indexes. You need to know about queries that are problematic, um, things like that. So yeah, I do, I do think overall more of a skew towards the kinds of, you know, needs that an app developer has and their usage of the database and helping them get more out of it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you know, one thing I was I was reading through your book, uh, I didn't make it all the way, but I made it a lot of the way. <laughs> oh. uh, and I, one thing I really like, first of all, like, uh, is you get like start everything off with like this sample application, like a ride sharing app, right? Yep. And like, that was great because you could follow along and see like how how it would relate right uh all the different optimizations and things but like second like uh i really loved your recommendation on like setting up a performance version of the database where you can just start testing and analyzing queries and poking around uh various tasks uh, i thought that was a great i mean i know a lot of people will have like a staging environment and <laughs> keeping that uh you know like production is like definitely a huge issue all by itself uh can probably be its own book <laughs> uh yeah. but i you did did give some great tips on kind of like how to copy over production like data from your production data uh and th there were some really great points about that uh and so i'm curious like <laughs> realistically like ha do you is that like is there a huge maintenance burden to adopting something like that to having that duplicate data and like querying it over time or is it kind of just like pan you know taper off after you it's already set up yeah i do think um so there's a whole backstory behind that chapter which was the original pitched chapter to the publisher um but i did try to produce uh at least for one table i think only but um you know, a way that you could script a process like that. So that if you did have, you know, there, there's what we didn't do with the book was we didn't really get into how are you actually running Postgres, you know, cause it could be a huge number of different ways, but if you can start from a database dump that you could generate with PG dump, or you could have access to snapshots if you're using a cloud provider or something, uh, we tried to provide an example where, um, here's how you would deal with all these, like, you know, tricky nuances with constraints like you know you you can remove foreign key constraints and add them back later for example stuff like that and um i do think it would be a pretty significant investment if you you know if you build a system like how that chapter describes across um a real running production applications database given it's got dozens of tables but I, i'll say that you know t in my experience the emphasis of that chapter is on Let's let's make your data safe to work with in a pre-production environment, and what that means is really removing the sensitive customer info and that kind of thing, which isn't really, you know, typically in my experience, it's not a big percentage of the overall app. So the the chapter has readers, uh, you know, just kind of using some some obvious, more obvious stuff like email addresses and things like that. You might want to scrub out, um, go through and and go through each of your tables, find the sensitive data in your database and and then if you focus your efforts just on scrubbing that you could bring over other table data as is and then that way like you said you've got this you've got this production like set of data you can work with in a pre-prod environment and if that's all too much um there are other solutions too i didn't actually get into it in the chapter but there are some ways you can you can mask data just on the fly with some postgres extensions and one thing a past company I looked at was there are SaaS providers that offer something similar to what is built in the chapter where they'll analyze your data and do some scrubbing. Uh, so, you know, if you wanted to make a, a buy approach, you could go that route too. But regardless of how you get there, I do think um, having some way to have a, 
we also considered calling it like a playground, but having some way to test with your real data is great because you can you can do a bunch of speculative indexes, you can do a bunch of um, <clears> schema <throat> changes, query changes, all kinds of things, and then you can just throw it away and regenerate it all again if you need. You know, but if um, we're talking at scale, um, and if you are taking a dump, sanitizing the user data, that time will also start to you know, linearly increase as the amount of data increases. Uh, I think yeah. you run into the same kind of problem if you're trying to do performance testing on a database and you're seeding in data, that can also take a lot of time to generate the data. So if we're, you know, talking about we're at that point where we're really starting to scale up, do we start getting diminishing returns from pulling down the production database because I've worked on some databases that were in the terabytes of data and to pull that down is just unrealistic right but to take a you know historical snapshot or something would be a lot more feasible when we were much smaller yeah what what I might recommend is the the idea the kind of the scale that the book is targeting to you know is I, I felt comfortable targeting a scale that I've worked with, which is databases that are in the kind of low terabytes range. And maybe you've got, um, you know, for, so I think for, for kind of like modern internet web applications, it's pretty easy to reach a terabyte of data. You know, if the application is successful and has been around for <laughs> a few years. Um, so what you might want to do, and some of the SaaS offerings do this kind of thing is you might want to move to sampling at a certain point where, mm -hmm. you know, you don't pull, every row, but maybe you keep, so this, this gets into a little bit of a trickier situation because ultimately you do have this graph of data that you, that applications expect to have. Um, so what you might want to do is, uh, look at a way to keep the graph intact with a smaller set of data. I've actually done some work on a separate project for that as well. Um, but yeah, it's true. Like when you get into when you have tables that are, you know, gigabytes, like there's just a lot of network movement that takes a lot of time. So I do think um, having, you know, leveraging, uh, leveraging, and this again too, by the way, there are other, like I mentioned, there are other solutions that are an alternative to this um, where you just do masking on the fly. You don't have as much security for the data at rest, that kind of thing. But um you know, I think it kind of depends on your, you know, your kind of time and investment trade-offs. Um, so yeah, the, the, I'd say that the intention of the book was to help you build, or that chapter was to help you build a scrubbing solution where you might have, um, you know, 10 to 20 tables where they could range in size from, they could be in the gigabytes themselves, mm -hmm. um, maybe up to, you know, low tens of gigabytes. And I think you can build a solution using the techniques in that chapter that runs in a reasonable amount of time that you could run like on a weekly basis, something like that. Cool. Yeah, and you know, sanitizing data, it's not only important for protecting the user privacy, but also their experience. Because if you have you know, wanted to just like run your local environment or something and you pull down that data, sanitize, so you're protecting the user data at rest, but then you've got to also change the API keys for whatever email account you were using, your testing stuff, sending out stuff to production clients. Yeah, that's a horrible situation. And I've seen that happen. And I've caused that situation in the past, to be honest. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, it's important. I, it's, it's important. Yeah, go ahead. I have a question on this, though, because a lot of that data, I've started using the active record encryption on it. Mm-hmm. And so when I'm sanitizing it, I can't just say, you know, run it across all these fields because they all get encrypted. Or can I? Is is there some way around that so that it happens fast? Or do I have to do each one on its own? Um, I haven't worked with active record encryption. And generally the content in that chapter was unencrypted content. So like plain text okay. you'd want to you'd want to scrub. Um, I'm assuming if you could bring your I, I would assume if you could bring your encryption keys into your pre-prod environment and decrypt, that might yeah. be one option. Um, if you, if you, otherwise, I think you might need some mechanism to maybe, maybe if you wanted to have separated, separated encryption, you could maybe decrypt and re-encrypt with a different key. You know, if if that had a lower security environment, I guess there's, 
Well, what I was thinking was more along the lines of I pull the data into my pre-prod environment. Um, since I have the encryption key on my local machine, of course, I have it in production as well. Um, right. Then, you know, when I load the app, it's going to show me real customer data. Right. Yeah. So if you have, so the, the chapter is actually a, a SQL oriented solution and using right. like shell scripts and. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so if you, you would need a, you would need rails or active record involved to decrypt the data. Right. And then, um, at that point you could invoke SQL from active record, I guess, cause you'd need a way to kind of like hook into that process. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, that, that was, that would be outside of the scope of what we did in the chapter. Okay. That being said, yeah, we did, uh, where I worked previously, we had database level field level encryption. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's a common requirement and a, a benefit for some kind of security audits and things like that, that you can show individual fields have an extra layer of protection. And, uh, so yeah, it's a good, good thing to raise awareness about. I'm also curious, you know, in kind of a high performance rail or high performance Postgres book, what's different about writing a high performance Postgres book for Rails developers versus just high performance Postgres? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I mean, there's certainly a lot of overlap and part of what inspired me was um, a book I had read from Greg Smith also called, well, it's called Postgres High Performance. Now, it was based on an earlier version of Postgres. But what I found is that, again, going back to that original question is it was a little more you know, administrator oriented without, of course, like without access to a particular code base or a sample app, or maybe like what a, what an application developer might be most concerned about, which I think is commonly kind of queries and indexes and things. So uh, on my kind of Postgres uh, enthusiasm arc, I came across uh, this person named Haki Benita, who is a, a blogger and presenter in the Postgres space. And um, Haki uh, first exposed me to the idea of like an application DBA as different from an infrastructure DBA, where the application DBA is going to care more about, this might be obvious, but just in case it's not for folks, uh, they're going to care more about what the application needs and how it works with Postgres. Mm -hmm. So, you know, queries and indexes and maybe some parameters that are related to queries, you know, or that kind of thing. <clears throat> so, um, you know, what's different about rails or even any client application the application or the book does have a, a dedicated chapter on active record and kind of like you know common usages and then more advanced usages but it's also kind of like not meant to be in a in a postgres vacuum and it's kind of like you're running a rails app so of course you want to take advantage of caches and things like that right. which are going to be way outside of postgres but they're going to be like application level or client level caches and Another question I had for myself in the beginning was, well, what's really different about Rails or Active Record than from some other language or framework, like for example, Python or Django, mm -hmm. uh, or Python and Django or Laravel and PHP or that kind of thing. Um, what I decided to do was focus on what I knew best with this and really make it about Ruby on Rails. But I have heard some folks that are from other communities, like they work with other languages and frameworks that are similar to Ruby on Rails and Ruby. And they've picked up the book and they found some, they found it to be valuable. And, and for example, for Django, you know, it's got a lot of similarities in uh, its ORM with writing migrations, some similarities with multiple databases support. Um, but uh, I don't work with those technologies regularly. And so if I had really kind of cooked up some examples, it, you know, it might've been fun, but um, it would have been outside of kind of what I knew best. So since I'd been working with Rails for like, you know, more than 10 years at different companies, I felt like I'd really try to focus on uh, what, you know, what do Rails developers care about that want to, that use Postgres, that want to, you know, use it. They want to know about all of the features that are available to them and kind of use it as more of a key tool in their overall stack. Yeah, you know, speaking of that, uh, I did pick up on a lot of the like advantages that Postgres has. Uh, I, I work in MySQL all day long, uh, and it, it's 
it's easy to pick up the advantages in Postgres, even from the Rails context from the, your book. Uh, and the like, <laughs> a simple example is like the returning clause in Postgres, where you can return uh, a record from your insert or something like that. Yep. Uh, so you can prevent a whole other, you know, select query and keep things transactional. I mean, there are just this is just one example of the many that you have in here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that I think that I think aren't you know necessarily Rails specific too, right? But just happen to be provided by the Rails framework. Uh, and so, like, I, I'm curious, like, <laughs> you know, what 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 was your favorite like kind of trick that you've picked up that where you just find yourself using it all the time? That's very much Postgres specific. Hmm. That's a good question. Um... Well, I would say that I guess I know that other relational databases have query planners, but I would say that I'm still, you know, years into really trying to learn what every line means in a lot of detail, looking at using the Postgres query planner and giving it all kinds of different queries or even looking at examples on the internet of other people's queries uh, and trying to understand all of the information that's available to me in there related to designing better indexes and um, storage access that's happening and the different algorithms for like different join types and things like that. So it's a, it's maybe not as exciting of a feature. I'll, I'll throw one more out though. Maybe um, part of the, part of why it's tricky. I've realized to answer this question. I've heard this question before in different contexts is Postgres really prides itself on its level of an adherence to the SQL standard. So there's a lot that's like, it's kind of like, well, there aren't, isn't actually a whole lot, I think, that is really Postgres specific because it does try to adhere highly to um, SQL standards. And in fact, there are discussions sometimes on the Postgres mailing list um, about you know, features that really need the support of a standard or a spec uh, before they get implemented in Postgres. Um, so I don't actually know what the support is from other relational databases, but I know in Postgres 16, for example, and there's coverage of this in the book, but there's a new keyword called merge, which is kind of the new way to do an upsert operation, which means either an insert or an update when you don't know what the state of the data is. And you can do that in one command. It's called the merge command. And um, there's a standard that supports it as well. And um, the cool thing about that is, you know, it's it's like another kind of SQL operation we have available, and then it could gain support in, you know, in the ORMs later by Active Record or that kind of thing. But yeah, that's maybe those are two things to consider. So with your book, I know it's geared towards Postgres, but there is a lot of overlap, in my opinion, between Postgres and MariaDB or MySQL. Yep. Can readers benefit if they do use MySQL as their primary database uh, from reading your book? Mine think, is the things that are, you know, Postgres specific. Yeah, because there really aren't, um, I actually tried to make, even, even the returning keyword that Valentino mentioned, I actually thought was exclusive to Postgres, but I believe it's supported in, S in SQLite as well. And um, there, you know, it's, I think the exclusion constraint is possibly only in Postgres, but I haven't really sat down and and went through kind of a blow by blow of what's exclusive to Postgres. Uh, there's actually a great resource and another uh, occasional collaborator, Tobias, uh, who runs sqlfordevs.com that I'll shout out. Uh, he, the emphasis that Tobias has is on um, kind of, you know, kind of like what it sounds. It's It's SQL for developers for relational databases, whether they use Postgres or MariaDB or MySQL or another relational database. And Tobias has a couple examples on his blog that I noticed where he calls out Postgres exclusive features. And um, I just don't recall any off the top of my head now, but I remember reading, you know, this is exclusive to Postgres. So I think he did a little of that research. Um, but yeah, the, to answer your question, kind of side conversation there. Um, yeah, I hope so. That, the intention of, for me, like part of what inspired me to write this book and a book in general is, um, is doing something that's going to be useful for a long time period. I'm hoping for like 10 years, you know, I mean, technology changes so quickly 
But um, one of the other inspirational books for me was from Pragmatic Programmers as well called SQL Anti-Patterns, SQL Anti-Patterns, which is about 10 years old or maybe even a little more. And uh, I was reading it in the last couple of years and found it, you know, super relevant and it's, you know, 10 years old. So I think that hopefully there's, I did try to minimize to some extent, really, I mean, there's certainly examples of things that are probably going to age poorly, you know, in a, in a year or two. But um, I think there's a lot of fundamentals like, you know, query, query performance, for example, being mindful of the actual storage access that's happening, like the IO that's happening, that's not going to really change over time. Like, you know, you want to restrict the query as much as possible to reduce your IO, like regardless of indexes. And there's examples in there of, of doing that for queries, for indexes. Um, so I, I do think that there are concepts that will easily translate. And then a lot of the SQL examples in the book, a lot of the book's examples are not in Ruby. They're in SQL or shell scripts. And um, those things, there's a pretty good chance you can run them as is on another relational database. Cool. And so what do you think about uh, solid cache and solid queue coming out from Basecamp and now leveraging the database instead of Redis or you know whatever uh, other mechanism it's using for caching or queuing up jobs? And how does that, do you think, affect short-term, long-term applications on performance? Yeah, so that was pretty cool to see because it felt like uh, it felt like a bonus because I was advocating for a similar thing um, in the last chapter of the book. The last chapter of the book kind of has readers uh, encourages readers to say, "What else can I use Postgres for that I might not be using it for now?" You know, using everything you've learned in the book prior to that point, writing efficient queries, good index design, good schema design that scales well, and stuff like that. Um, you know, maybe you could consider using it for your cache store or for your background job processing and that kind of thing. So when that, that came out of Rails world this past fall, those projects were announced, Hey, we can use the relational database for more things because, you know, because of SSDs and because of faster storage access and like operations that we wanted to use an in-memory store for before we can actually do now with kind of like our boring old relational database. Um, that was, that was awesome. I was like, Hey, this is great. This ties right into the book. And, um, yeah, so there is an existing good Postgres, uh, open source. I've had the the privilege of meeting the creator a bit, Ben, um, a uh, tool called uh, good job and you can run background jobs with good job and it's, you know, uh, well used in production and that sort of thing. And then on the caching side, um, there, there's a couple of solutions that are showed in the book where you can uh, throw your kind of small bits of data into, um, you can use a couple tricks like an unlogged table if you're okay with losing that data if Postgres were to crash, if you wanted to, if you had a mechanism to rebuild cache data, for example. Um, and, you know, you can use tactics like running a separate instance that might be a, another Postgres instance that's your cache instance, for example. And the benefits of doing that are you can still kind of work with the data with SQL, still same like observability, logging, access, those kinds of things. Um, so yeah, so I think in general, like having background jobs processing, you know, cache entries and that kind of thing, having some extra kind of advocacy around that for the using the relational databases is um, is exciting because, like I said, it ties into the book. But I think the latter part of your question was. Was what was the latter part? Is kind of like what are the implications of that? Or yeah, on a you know, and kind of where I was going with this is I tried out solid caching, and I'm actually using it on Drift Ruby in production. Oh, cool! And one of the caches I had, I'd never realized, but it was doing a per user level caching. So it was caching the user ID when it was generating a view. You know, I thought for performance reasons, but what ended up happening was using solid cache gave me visibility into like how much I was actually caching stuff. And after just a week, I had over uh, almost 100,000 cache entries into the table for solid queue, or I'm sorry, solid cache. I'm like, that's way too high. It should not be nowhere near that high. So uh, that gave me the opportunity to go back and look at how I was caching and then 
you know, that kind of stuff. But if that had happened on a larger application and if it had happened, you know, uh, exponentially more, then, you know, what kind of implications will we be looking at? So would something like solid cache start to degrade the performance of normal queries, reads, and writes? You know, assuming it's right. on the same database. Yeah. Yeah. So um, for anyone that's not familiar, you can run, whether you're using Postgres or a different database engine or like, a, yeah, a different relational database technology, you can run a database is like a logical grouping and that runs on a server instance or a host or, a, you know, they're called different things. In Postgres, we typically call it instance. And you could, if you ran, even if you separated out your cache database with, um, but it ran on the same instance, then any of that read write activity and IO activity would affect the resource that would consume resources on that same instance that would contend with the resources for your main applications queries. So you definitely would want to be mindful of the impact on that. Um, for example, with caching, if you, if you had a design, you know, with Postgres, you know, one of its less, or it's one of its more infamous features uh, is how it does multi-version concurrency control, how it does essentially concurrent access, control, controlling concurrent access to the same rows and tables that are, you know, different clients are accessing. Um, for update and delete operations, uh, the way it works is when those updates and deletes occur, it leaves around, it essentially creates a new immutable version of the change and it leaves around the old one. And that then is cleaned up later by the vacuum process, which runs automatically. So when this is running in the background, so what is, why am I bringing that up now? Because if you have a high churn table with a lot of updates and a lot of deletes, you're going to be, and, and depending on how you've tuned vacuum, you're going to be triggering vacuum uh, more likely more. And that can take away some resources from your kind of um, main client query workload. So as a, when you're administering Postgres, you know, you want to be mindful of what's happening behind the scenes to kind of keep the operations running and then what's happening in the foreground with your client application queries. So for something like caching, what I'd recommend is if it's completely new, um, you know, I think it's always a good technique for high scale applications to introduce changes gradually. So maybe you could, you could have, if you had a, a caching solution that was like, let's say in Redis or a different cache store, you could gradually introduce some of that traffic into your relational solution. Ideally, if you could double write it for a while and you could kind of see what the operational impact is on your instances. And then you could gradually add more um, as opposed to kind of like a full cutover in a uh -oh situation. <laughs> um, and then of course, like ideally if you could run, you know, depending on your scale, this adds a lot of complexity. If you have a big scale application, you might be wanting to run it on a different instance entirely. So it'd be separated both at the database level and at the instance level. And I haven't really looked into solid cache yet, the implementation, but we know that active record supports multiple databases, um, <clears throat> which by the way, was also one of my inspirations for the book too, is that I think there, I think the multiple databases support really opens up being natively in the framework opens up a lot of use cases for running multiple instances and kind of thinking, thinking like of your overall op operations as not tied to just one instance, for example. So yeah, you could have, you could have, you know, just this one separate, separately scalable instance. Like let's say you're on a cloud provider, you know, you provision it, you start writing all your cache there. And that way, you know, you have isolation of the compute that's being used for that read and write activity, that's going to be separate from your application's resources, the database that your application is reading and writing to. Yeah, my understanding with solid cache is that by default, it just holds on to everything that it caches for 90 days and then starts cleaning it up. And so, um, yeah, you know, after you hit that 90 day threshold, yeah, I don't know what the algorithm is for cleaning it up. I think it just cuts everything off that's older than whatever um but or it hasn't been used since whenever yeah but um yeah and so so the the implications at least for the first 90 days are probably minimal if you're talking about the way that it cleans those things up um i'm, I'm incidentally i'm using solid cache as well on top end devs um but yeah the I, i'd be really curious to see 
what kind of information you could pull from the database you know if you evaluate what's in there what's in that cache but uh and i, and yeah, I that, can see that as a, a possible upside to to using something like solid cache yeah and the, and the you know if you're you know for I, I think what's really cool about with both caching and background job processing this will it sounds like this will be rails 8 the next ver major version of rails or you need to pull in these gems now um you know and if you don't have solutions for these you, you probably do if you have a in production rails app but if you're building a new rails app having these in the framework gets you going you know with minimal dependencies to start which i think can help you know bring your mm -hmm. your product to market quickly and um i think it was yeah dave i think you had said that you can leverage your existing observability tools and SQL skills to see what what data you know if if maybe you didn't write the cache store part but you're on a team where you're maintaining it you know you can go and inspect it using SQL it's going to show up in your likely if you're using an APM tool it's going to show up there it's going to be a, a access and it's not that you couldn't have an APM tool with different data stores but you're going to have like a lot of uh, you know, going to reuse the benefits you have for your regular application queries for like a cache store setup. And then, you know, if you want to, there are, there are some techniques in Postgres anyways, that, you know, could help you besides moving to a separate instance could help you manage that high. If it's a high growth rate data, um, you could look at table partitioning. There's a whole chapter in the book on that, where um, you can create a system. If you do find that you're, you're, you want to kind of cap uh, either the amount of data that you store, you can design a partitioning structure that makes it very efficient to get rid of older data that you don't want any longer. That could be a good fit for a cache store as well. Yeah, you can configure solid cache to use multiple databases. So, I, yeah, I don't know if it uses any of those strategies. It'd be interesting to see that built in or a plugin that lets you do that, right? Where you can set the partitioning to something other than whatever hash key it uses or whatever. Yep. Yeah, the table partitioning is something that I like to um, mention to folks because I think it's a it is it is a little bit it's it's kind of an interesting feature because it's native to Postgres for six major versions now. So it's it's not you could do it's it's what that means is that there's keywords that are built into Postgres. It's well documented. It's tested on each major version, et cetera. But there isn't support for it in active record. And I think generally it's kind of like one of those things where it just goes beyond what the app dev might typically do. And it might be like a DBA sort of thing. But what I found is every Rails app I've worked on, there's always one or two tables where it would be a good fit that are kind of like, they're either time oriented or they could be, you could seg you could imagine how you could segment the data up and how over time some of that data will be more useful and others will be less useful. Like for example, if you have customer multiple customers in your you know in a single table and some of those customers churn then you're kind of just carrying around row data that's not being accessed anymore and that kind of thing and so i do think yeah table partitioning i did it's it's one of the features that is most exciting and interesting to me because i think it is so useful and it's kind of underused it's also more complex so it's it's towards the end of the chapters of the book but um, yeah, I think it fits with a lot of app scenarios and it also fits with this cache situation. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, I saw that you gave an example of like archiving older tables or just rows that you just don't need to reference anymore. And I feel like that's a very common scenario, right? It's like, okay, you, you just have this table that grows and like 90% of the information you don't care about. Like, right. Right. You just need it there for like, you know, for reporting. <laughs> yeah. Right. And I feel like there's no good mechanism in place, like for rails to like set how you want the table to grow and, you know, archive over time. Uh, so this it's really interesting. I, I'm I'd be interested in that, too, to see where that leads, because I feel like there's like a huge opportunity there. Right. Um, because I don't know of a good way other than <laughs> just throwing in a data lake and, you know, cleaning it up in the background uh, and hoping that, you know, you can access everything later. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's, 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 uh, thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. That, that's been my experience too, across different companies and teams I've worked on is there's, there's, there's the, 
either we just kind of leave it and it's just a table that gets bigger and bigger forever and queries slow down and indexes take longer to build and there's more latency on index maintenance and or maybe they have like a a background job that deletes old records once in a while and that's actually the perfect use case for uh range partitioning in postgres i think for active record to support it there'd need to be an equivalent partitioning type in the other supported relational databases um mysql and i have i don't know how this works in sqlite but assuming it's it's similar with you know because it has a whole different storage model and stuff like that um in theory though it could be it could be part of an object relational mapper is you could have some kind of like a you need to like you need a few pieces running at the same time for it to work though because um with this kind of scenario where we're talking about where you might remove old records that's usually something that happens um through like it's it doesn't happen natively it needs to be like invoked so it could be something running it could be some um procedural language code running within postgres or it could be an external client so in the book um readers use the pg slice gem which is a ruby gem and um the the app for the book by the way is is public and it's open source on github and uh pg slice is included there so you can kind of practice but the idea is that after some period of time uh happens to actually remove the data uh you would need to run a few operations so you can detach a partition you can archive the data and that kind of thing um i th i think it's possible that that could be integrated into the framework though and actually now that i'm now that we're talking about it i do remember some discussions about exploring that in a future rails release so it'd be interesting it's it's like this tension though i think between do everything in, in Ruby and Active Record, and like you know, do we want to leverage these higher powered database features or not? You know, <laughs> yeah, it does seem though that we could have some kind of plugin either for the PG Gem or Active Record that you know it just basically says we're going to assume you're using Postgres if you install this gem and then give us access there because uh, I think most of the people I talk to they they don't necessarily want to get into the SQL all that much and they don't want to go and you know fiddle with postgres on you know on its own they really do want to manage as much of as as much of it as they can in their rails app and so um you know i think it could be interesting to see hey there is this power feature in postgres and here's the plugin that lets you access it mm -hmm. and yeah if you switch to sqlite it's either going to no op or it's going to blow up um yeah, so I think for readers of, I mean, so PG Slice only works with Postgres, um, but you know there would be a relatively thin wrapper if you wanted to be able to write Ruby code. Like what PG Slice does is it really just invokes SQL commands that run against Postgres. And um, <clears throat> the cool thing about table partitioning is that it's declarative like SQL and that it presents tables to the application as if they're kind of regular tables. So in a sense, you do get that benefit of not having to care too much about the implementation details about how the old rows are removed. And under the covers, what's happening is there's this structure where you have this parent table and you have these child tables underneath it. And so you could imagine a setup from the application level where, again, you don't really need to get into the, the SQL commands if you have this kind of app, like programming language level um, interface that sets up the you know sets up this table structure in the first place and this is pretty much what pg slice does but you could generalize this to other relational databases sets up the structure and then it takes care of writing and reading rows of data that you've described are the kind of range that you want and then the stuff that's older is just taken care of for you it's removed in some way and, and you know for for anyone that's listening that wants to try this out a bit they can do this right now with the rideshare app and with Postgres and it's all runnable locally. So you can um, just install Postgres on your local, um, you know, in my case, Mac OS machine and install PG Slice and the Rideshare app and play around with table partitioning. And then, you know, hopefully from that point, you'll be able to evaluate how you might use it in your, your uh, production app. I just looked up PG Slice, I was unfamiliar with it and it was written by Andrew Kane. 
I mean, is there anything he hasn't written? <laughs> no, he has written everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's a lot of, um, I've gotten the chance to send a few messages back and forth with Andrew and, um, yeah, it's, there's a lot of things that he's works on that are mentioned in the book. And I think as any long time Ruby on rails developer knows, he's creates a lot of open source software. And so, um, besides PG slice, uh, readers also work with PG hero, which is a cool Postgres open source performance dashboard. And then, uh, lately Andrew's been working on PG vector, which is, um, helps you turn Postgres into a vector database and, and gives you, um, gives you uh, comparable or competitive performance to dedicated vector store vector databases like Chroma DB and Pinecone and some others with Postgres. And it's supported by PG vector has been added as a supported extension to a lot of cloud providers. So it's something people can use. For those who aren't familiar, vector databases are typically used for machine learning and things like that. Yep. So I, I wanted to dive in here to like this advanced usage with extensions. Because uh, I've only ever like just installed, a, you know, Postgres extension and then just like hope that it continued working. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't have I don't have like a, too much experience. Like I identify with this approach. Years, right? Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, have you had like any bad experience like installing an extension and then having to maintain that, like having issues with that? Because it does seem like very easy to make an extension to Postgres. And that to me always sets off alarm bells like, uh oh, like this is going to be a pain to upgrade because it's so easy. Yeah, I, I think you have better uh, developer instincts than I do sometimes because I'll just like you, YOLO myself into those situations and then I'll realize later like, oh, yeah, you, this is also software that needs to be upgraded. And and, and that is true. Like it, it, you can get into a jam. Um, in when you do major version upgrades, if they don't, if, if there's some kind of breaking change. So typically what I would recommend is for, for most of the well-supported. So most of the things in the book are, I tried to focus, there's about, I've, I've told folks there's about 40. Uh, if you add up all the Postgres extensions that are mentioned and Ruby gems outside of Ruby on rails, um, with most of these being, I think, I don't know, I guess what the split is, but there's around 40 pieces of software that are, you know, they're all open source. And, um, with the extensions generally where I've worked, we've used uh, Amazon web services, which has this curated smaller set of extensions. And, um, the, the benefit of that, while it's a smaller set, that means you can't use a lot of, um, extensions because that you can only use what AWS supports. The benefit of that is that AWS has done some vetting of that and they kind of Essentially, they kind of support that if you're moving to different versions and that kind of thing. So for things like um, um, PG Cron, for example, is one that's mentioned in the book. Or another popular way to do partitioning is with the PG Partman extension or um, some of the built-in ones that ship with Postgres, like Auto Explain or PG Stat Statements. Um, you, you know, Generally, you're not going to have problems going to a new major version of Postgres but you might need a new inversion of the extension. So, you know, depending on how, again, how you are running Postgres and how it's distributed, that could involve, you know, if you're self running Postgres, that could involve compiling a new version of the extension. And um, to do that in production, it would probably be like a cutover situation. And then you need to enable the new version of the extension. So what I found generally is extensions are versioned as well. And usually they publish a, a change log and that kind of things. So you can kind of see like, how are they tracking against which major version of Postgres? Yeah, I actually ran into that recently with good job because I was uh, adding it on a much older application that I had. And I didn't realize that I was using Postgres 12. So I had to enable the PG crypto gem. And I was wondering, like, man, why is this not working? Then I went back and saw the migration and his little footnote that Ben had in there. I'm like, oh, you know, so that was the first time where I ever tried using uh, Postgres in a situation where I was just not really familiar, just kind of testing things out. Mm -hmm. And then the extensions kind of bit me. But it was an easy resolution, not what you're talking about here. That's good. Yeah. I mean, it does, it does kind of what the book's philosophy is that if you, you know, you know, hopefully at, by the end of the book, the, you feel more comfortable as a reader using Postgres as more of a first class, uh, 
part of your stack, like beyond just basic kind of read and write operations. And that does include taking advantage of Postgres's extensibility through its extensions and understanding a bit. You know, that being said, I think there probably could be, you know, maybe I'll write up a blog post on this. There probably could be more on the life cycle of extensions, you know? Um, <clears throat> but um, yeah, it is, I, I think it, you could consider looking at it like, or like a, a a listener or a possible reader of the book could consider it like, you know, when we do web application development, we don't, we work with lots of different things. We also work with front end technologies that have their own extensibility and their own extensions and mechanisms and, and that kind of thing. And Ruby on Rails <clears throat> helps us by letting us like, you know, build assets and things. But if you've gone through the pain of, you know, managing like node versions and NPM and things like that for full stack Rails apps, um, you know, I, I feel like you probably can take on Postgres extensions and that kind of thing. Like, you know, Postgres does have a great, um, you know, there's, there's lots of great documentation and then support channels and mechanisms as well. Um, I know I'm, I'm pretty active in the Postgres community Slack, which is pretty popular. So it can pop in there and ask questions or answer questions. And, um, so that being said, I think it's a little outside of the realm of what a lot where a lot of Rails developers hang out, kind of. Mm -hmm. But you can get, you know, if you if you get stuck on an extension upgrade, like there's ways to power through those problems too. Yeah, I think the good job one is a real scenario that people could face. So let's say if I enabled good job on my application and it was using Postgres 12. There's that enable PG crypto line that you want to comment. Now you can use it on your Rails app that's using Postgres 12. That's well, right. if I were to go and upgrade to Postgres 13, I still have my old migration that has that enable uh, PG crypto extension. So what happens then when I upgrade to Rails or to Postgres 13? Would I need another migration that disables that extension or, you know, what would happen? Because now it's kind of baked into Postgres 13 and later. That's right. Yeah. In newer versions, um, I'm familiar with what you're talking about. And in newer versions of Postgres, you can generate UUIDs val uh, values natively if people didn't know that. And prior to Postgres 13, you needed an extension. There's also another one that's common, like um, UUID. Well, there's another UUID dash OSSP, I think it's called. Um, so if you moved, if you did a major version upgrade, then <clears throat> you probably would want to, you know, if you didn't have this awareness that you could drop that extension, what the way I would approach it would be by my default way of working would be, well, I need to make sure this, all of my extensions work on my new target upgrade version. And, but if I knew that I didn't actually need it, then I could make that part of the upgrade process where I, I, um, you know, it depends. You can do with Postgres upgrades, you can do an in place upgrade, and there's a built in mechanism for that. And that's going to work differently than there's another technique where you can do a cutover, where you can basically restore your data to a new instance running the new major version, and you can kind of cut your application over. And there's got it, you know, they have different trade offs with how you test that and how you. Um, ensure that you have uh, minimal amounts of downtime and that kind of thing. Um, so I guess I started talking about the path where if you knew you didn't need that extension and you wanted to rely on the native UUID generation, the way I would approach that is I would want to test my Rails application that depends on that UUID generation. I'd want to test that like um, on a, a code branch that tests against the Postgres, the new version, let's say 13 on a CI system or something. So I run my full application test suite and make sure that it's still generating UUIDs and reading them. It's just doing it with a different approach. If I did the in-place upgrade, then um, what I would probably do is look into the release notes for that extension and see if it's supported with the same version on the new major version of Postgres, which if that was the case, that would be great because then we wouldn't really need to do anything. If that wasn't the case, then I would see if possibly we could upgrade the extension on the old version first before we did the new major version of Postgres upgrade. And if we could do that, again, there might be like the caveats here are you have to plan out like, you know, you want to test this kind of thing on a separate instance, like a pre-prod instance, and kind of see what the impact is 
collect timing and see like what the downtime impact might be. Ideally, you can do it quickly, maybe with very low, you know, five minutes, plan it on a weekend or something like that. Upgrade the extension version, um, make sure it works with your application. And then that, that way, then it's kind of separated from your Postgres upgrade. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it's a, it's a fine dance. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's, a, it's really like the, you know, the, the maintenance of, of applications over time, you know, like, uh, you know, similar challenges sometimes with, with Ruby gems that might have like native dependencies or, um, you know, yeah, there's, it's for any kind of long running, but, you know, hopefully successful application that is, you know, providing a lot of value, you're going to run into these upgrade challenges. I, I had an advanced question again, <laughs> uh, cause I noticed, uh, you know, also notes in the book of like creating functions and procedures and things like that. Uh, and I, I found good uses for them in the Don't past. <laughs> it's, I know you would think. <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, are they a good idea to do? And maybe like when, when are they or aren't, right? Like, because uh, I still don't know <clears throat> the answer to that personally. Uh, so I'd love some you know, <laughs> yeah. professional insight here. <laughs> Yeah, it's tricky. I mean, I mostly worked with Ruby with teams that mostly write Ruby. And so like, hey, let's write these procedures in the database or these functions in the database. Like you got to have a pretty compelling, um, <clears throat> if you have some other senior engineers, you're trying to convince why it's better. You have to have some pretty, you know, irrefutable evidence maybe in modern times uh, for why you're not just doing it with the application language. Um, so I think that if you have something that, you know, it's, it's maybe not the most satisfying answer, but I've, for, for functions, you can write them with, um, just with the SQL language itself. And if, if you have something that's relatively simple, like IE a SQL query, you can run outside of the scope of a function. And it's almost like it doesn't need to be tested. Like it's, um, what's an example. Let me think about an example for a second. But if you have a simple SQL query or you're using some built-in functions to Postgres, like you're doing some basic transformations and then you want to kind of combine those. And that's, I think, you know, there's for sure examples of this in the book. Like you combine a few transformations of data with a new custom function that you write, you store it in your app. Um, I think that they're, I think they're fine. I think that they're an alternative to <coughs> writing uh, relatively straightforward code that you might write in Ruby, but executing within the database. And then what that gives you is possibly you need to test this on your own use cases, but possibly less like better performance through reduced IO or reduced network access. So if you have to like pull data to Ruby, do some stuff, write it back in versus like, if you can just send one operation, that's, you know, um, that does a transformation within Postgres and does a write. Um, which I guess I kind of am segueing now into procedures. So with, so functions, procedures are a more advanced form of functions in Postgres. And with procedures, you can get transactional control, which means you can create your own transactions. So you can do like, you know, again, this is, you know, you want to be careful with getting too complex here without having kind of like unit tests and other things. Um, which you might, you don't have unless you bring those in as well to Postgres, which there's like PG tap and there's other solutions. But, um, if you wanted to do something like with a transaction where you fetch some data, write some data, something like that, then again, that could be a reasonable usage for procedures. Um, not being very specific here, kind of being hand wavy. What the approach I took, I didn't, I didn't really feel like I could make a strong, you know, these are the situations you should definitely use functions or procedures, and these are the ones you shouldn't. But what that book does is it shows, it uses um, uh, some tools like the Scenic Ruby Gem, for example, and um, I believe some others. Uh, oh, the FX Ruby Gem to show developers of Rails applications how they could manage their functions and triggers and procedures, kind of, and treat them more like uh, application code. So you can use those tools to create versions of your functions, for example. And then, you know, as you revise those functions, you can create new versions and it's all visible with regular old active record migrations, which I thought was pretty cool. So 
I think that kind of gets you like a halfway measure to making those kind of database only disconnected somewhat functionalities like connected more to your application. Um, and then it's it's probably going to be up to you and your team to decide if you want to implement um, uh, certain functionality that way versus at the client level. And I, th I think it kind of comes back to like benchmarking and how valuable it is and that kind of thing. Cool. We're kind of getting toward the end of our time. Uh, one question that I wanted to ask before we wrap up is, um, so for a long time, it seems like the kind of low hanging fruit has been just indexes and N plus one queries and stuff like that. Is is that still the low hanging fruit or is that just kind of something everybody does at this point and the next level of low hanging fruit is something else? Yeah, I, I felt like, there are some people that even say like, who cares about N plus one queries? Um, because sometimes, you know, depending on how your application is structured, they, well, okay, let me take a step back. So I do think that they're a good entry point into like, here's a, here's a query pattern that is um, problematic, but it's really like, why is it problematic? And so then I think it's like, well, each connection, each query uses up a database connection. Well, what are con database connections? Well, they're a finite resource and there's actually some overhead with establishing new connections. How do we establish new connections? Well, in Active Record, we use the connection pool. What's a connection pool? So it creates this like, there, there's a, it's a good way to, I think, start to learn about all of the pieces about what's happening from writing Active Record code to that getting turned into a SQL query that's sent over the network, what's happening on Postgres, um, but I don't think that typically M plus one queries, I don't think that they're, um, they're, they're pretty well understood and there's a lot of tools. There's even, there's one in the book that are commonly is like, they're, they're well known as an anti-pattern. Yeah. And so there's a lot of tools that help detect them and even sometimes fix them. So I think that it's a, it's a good entry point. And then I think if you're a developer, that's like, you know, I got M plus ones under control. Um, I think the next, next place to, to consider um is uh, as far as leveling up with your database skills would be to look at um a more advanced query design and and really indexes i think indexes usually at the end of the day are uh, you know they're the tool that you have as a developer to make your queries fast and to make your mm -hmm. queries low cost as well so if you can very efficiently if your application's data that it needs to access can be done very efficiently you can use up minimal amounts of resources on your instance and you can um, have greater scalability. Cool. All right. Now, one more thing before we get to picks, and that is, <clears throat> thanks for listening to the end of the segment. Um, now, Andrew, work things out so we can give away a copy of the book. Yep. And so what we're going to do is, um, if you go to rubyrogues.com slash, what should we call it, Postgres book, um, it will take you to a place where you can actually uh, enter to win. And it's one of those where you can also share the contest to get more entries and things like that. Um, and so oh, cool. we'll, we'll run it that way. Um, and we'll make sure that it's up by the time this goes live. And uh, yeah, um, if you've won, then we'll let you know and we'll let uh, pragmatic programmers know and you'll get a copy of the book in your account. Um and yeah, I think that's kind of the best way to do that. Um, I've set up a couple of other of these for like conference tickets and stuff. So awesome. Um, that sounds great. Yeah. So it's 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 a system that works pretty well. So yeah, that's uh, rubyrogues.com slash postgres book. If you can't find it that way, just go to the show notes and we'll we'll have a link there too. So you can enter to win. Um, and we'll run it for like two weeks after the episode goes live. And um, that way you have plenty of chances to get in and get you know, get entered and then, and then we'll give the book away. And then if you don't win, go buy it. All right. Um, let's do picks. Valentino, what are your picks? Uh, so I've uh, joined a makerspace, which if you have one in your area, I highly recommend joining. It's just so much fun. Uh, so I've been playing with the 3D printers a lot. Uh, they have a lot of them. And uh, the Prussia MK4 is just fantastic machine uh just additive printing layer by layer and the granularity on it is you can't even see the layers even it's so like small uh which is 
to me wild. Uh, the first time I used an additive printer, I was like, why would anyone buy one of these? It's just so choppy. Uh, but they've come a long way. So <laughs> uh, definitely recommend uh, that printer for sure. Awesome. Dave, what are your picks? So a couple of picks. Um, I'm an idiot. So I accidentally refreshed one of my computers. And I didn't realize that I had all of my Thanksgiving photos on there that I had taken when I was traveling. And so I deleted everything. Luckily, I had a time machine backup that did have them on there. And I also checked Backblaze, oh, nice. which also had it backed up up there. So back up your data. Use a time machine, get a hard drive or something, back up your data because wherever you have it stored on isn't guaranteed. And you could either do something dumb like me and delete it or your computer could crash, get stolen or whatever. So have good backups. And then speaking of computers, I got this Silverstone case that I absolutely love. So before I had all my computers just kind of sitting up on my desk and stuff. And I got tired of them sitting up on my desk. I like the desk real estate to just be able to spread out. So I got a half rack that's sitting next to me that have all my audio gear. And now my computers, I put them in a Silverstone case. It's a 4U. So I was able to use all my existing components. I didn't have to get anything new except for the case. So now I have a 25U rack next to me that's sadly already filled. So I don't have any more space to play. I'll have to check that out. I've been wanting to put a rack in here for all my audio and other equipment. So, yeah. Uh, I'm going to jump in. I always do a board game pick or a card game pick. This one is, if you're a big fan of Disney, um, one of the games we got for Christmas is the Disney chrono Chronology game. And uh, basically, you draw a card, you read it to the player to your left, um, and then it has a month and a year uh, that the thing occurred. So it'll be like this song from this movie won an Oscar or Academy Award or whatever. I don't know which ones are which, but it won an award, right? And so it was the, the big song of the year. And um, and then that person, they'll have, you start with three cards in front of you and you're either picking before all of them, after all of them, or in between two of them, right? And so um, you decide which slot it goes in if you're right, you get the card, you put it into your chronology, and right the next time you go, you have four card you four cards in front of you and you pick, you know, between two or on the ends. Um if you get it wrong, then the next person around the table gets a shot at it to put it in their chronology. And so sometimes you get lucky and right, you have, you know, 1955 and 1956. And so if there's something right around there that's hard. But then that you get something that you know is in the 80s or 90s and you don't know better than that, you can just put it on the end. So that's nice. Um, but yeah, we had a good time. Um, I live with a bunch of Disney nuts. And so uh, I'll, I'll admit to also being a big Disney fan. So it was fun, right? To just go, okay, you know, Steamboat Willie was 1920 something, right? And so you fit it into your chronology and just, you know, see how well you can remember when the things come out. Uh, so uh, anyway. Disney chronology, fun game. Um, a couple of other picks that I have. I'm trying to remember what I picked on uh, JavaScript Jabber just a minute ago. Um, I'm blanking out. My life's been so crazy lately. Um, I think I'm just going to leave it there with with that pick. Um, and uh, Andrew, what are your picks? Yeah. I I um, <clears throat> wasn't familiar with the picks, but I'm going to use context clues here. And I'm, I've come up with uh, two picks that I think maybe fit the style or the goals of the pick section. So one is um, imagine that you've been writing a book for like 18 months and you sit at your computer for long hours and your legs are stiff and, you know, maybe you've put on a couple of pounds. Well, <laughs> uh, I have, I got something for you. I'd recommend uh, this. I picked up a walking pad on Amazon for about 200 bucks. It's from Eurovo, but I think there's a whole bunch of them. Um, and uh, I've got a standing height desk. So um, I've had it for about a month now. And I found it's really nice to um, get some extra steps in during the day. And I found I can even, I wasn't sure if I'd be able to, but I can type um, at about, if I walk at about like one and a half miles an hour or so, maybe max, I can still kind of type. And it helps me feel a lot 
um, better than, you know, extended periods of sitting is to just get a little bit of steps in. So I think that's, that's been nice. And then my, um, on, on topic recommendation or pick, um, I became a subscriber myself to PG mustard, which is a Postgres query plan visualization and recommendations, uh, SAS product. And, um, there are what, what PG mustard tries to do over some free and open source alternatives is give you some recommendations that are a little bit more deeper on your, your schema design and your index design and that kind of thing. And it's a run by a Michael Christofides, who's, it's just a real small operation and he's, um, become someone I've gotten to know a bit through the Postgres community. So I like to, uh, shout it out to recommend that as well. And uh, I've, I've been able to use it to help optimize some queries and index designs. Awesome. Before we wrap up, where do people find you online? I'm on uh, Twitter and X at and at key. And uh, I blog at Andy Um And then I also have a, a newsletter going for the book at PG Awesome. If you put those links into the chat, then I'll, get them over into the comments we'll do um and yeah uh we'll go ahead and wrap it up here thanks for coming andy this was awesome thanks guys yeah it was great to uh, share this with you and thanks for having me all right till next time folks max out